Well, good morning. What a way to start off the service here. We're celebrating 179 years, and we have this wonderful choir. Give it up. Give them a hand one more time, the choir. <laughs> and you notice they stuck me way in the back. There. Anyways, you heard me. Good. Mark heard me. I'm, I'm glad. Okay, uh, well, I just want to welcome you all uh, to our, our service here this morning, our 8.30 time of worship. Uh, is everybody enough, tired of the drizzle? Okay, I am so tired of three days of drizzle, but it is a day that we can celebrate. We thank the Lord for the rain because we know it replenishes the earth, and also it gives us an opportunity to uh, come inside, I guess, and, uh, and, and worship together. But we are glad that you're here this morning. Uh, to celebrate with us. And if you are a visitor, we're especially glad that you're here. There is a card in the pew in front of you that says welcome. And if you are visiting today, we would love for you to take just a few moments to uh, fill that out so we can have a record of your visit. And we are glad to just get these cards from visitors and new folks in our area into our church. And so we're just happy about that. A couple of things I'll mention today uh, is uh, that there will be no evening services tonight here at the church uh, because of, of Harvest Day, but we will have uh, a number of things going on today. So just hang around. If you don't know what's going on today, just kind of hang around the church until about you know one, one o'clock or so, and something will be going on for you. Uh, there's another uh, announcement that I would like to make is uh, a bit of a different one, but uh, all of our ministry and committee leaders are reminded that your budget requests are due. Uh, this comes from our, uh, our stewardship committee, and so you need to make sure to get those in. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then don't worry about it. But uh, we are preparing our budget for next year, so we do need to make sure to get all those budget request forms in as soon as possible. Well, next weekend, I'll invite you all out uh, to be a part of our community event, Autumn Fest, and also uh, Scarecrow Hollow, which is going on that evening, and so those evenings, Friday and Saturday, and then Autumn Fest will be on Saturday during the day. Uh, please be a part of that if you can, volunteer if you can, but if not, then just be in prayer for uh, the opportunities that we do have to uh, reach out to our community. Uh, this is, our fall events are always very popular um, because it just seems like people are wanting to get out. Now, if it's like it is this weekend, uh, we do have a rain date, uh, for that, and it's on the flyer uh, for that, but, but we're hoping and praying that, that, uh, that the rain holds off so that we can have our community events. Well, there's a lot to be excited about today. Why don't we all stand and greet one another as we begin? Let's sing together. I love you with a love of the Lord. Yes, I love you with a love of the Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King. Yes, I love you with a love of the Lord. Well, what better hymn can we sing on the 179th birthday of our church than to God be the glory. Great things he has done and great things he will continue to do. Let's sing that hymn together.
God, we thank you that we were in our sin. God, you did not turn your back to us, but you set your face toward us in great compassion. And God, there you left heaven. You came to this sinful world. And God, there we didn't have what we needed to even see who you were. God, we nailed you to a cross. And God, we were found guilty. And yet, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you gave us your righteousness in exchange for our sin. God, you died the death that was ours. You gave us righteousness freely of no cost to us, but of all the cost to you. And so, God, everything that we do today is to lift high the cross, to lift high the person of Jesus, and God, we thank you that you have loved us enough to give all. And so, God, we thank you for this day in the history of our church. God, that these people have given some so that more people can hear about all that you have given. And God, we pray that in days ahead that this would not be the end of a journey but that this would be the beginning of a new chapter of blessing to this community. God, we ask for expanded ministry only because there are still hurting people. And God, we believe that through the power of the cross, God, you are able to bring about profound healing. And God, we ask you to do it in a powerful way through the vessel of your church in Jesus name amen you may be seated
Well, let's pray together. My Father, thank you that we can sing loud and clear from the souls, from the bottom of our heart, that, that you are the King, the Redeemer, the one who reached down into the, into the bottom of hell and plucked us up and gave us life. And God, that, that life just pours forth from us. Thank you, my God, for saving us and allowing us to know who you are. You shared the brilliant light of glory with us, God. You put heaven in our soul. And uh, how can we ever repay a God that is so full of grace and truth and forgiveness and love? God, we owe you everything we have. Now bless this offering, God. May it be used in a powerful way to bring light to other folks. In the name of Jesus, amen. What a joy it is to be with you today on October the 13th, 2013, our 179th year anniversary, Harvest 2013. Today, we get to celebrate not only our rich past and old friends, but today we get to celebrate our bright future and the potential for new friends to come. Today it is my prayer that we lay a foundation for future years of ministry. You know, God has certainly been faithful to Liberty Baptist Church. 179 years is the test of time. You know, the world has changed so much in 179 years, and it has been by God's grace that this church has been able to manage every obstacle and has been able to maximize every opportunity. And so this day, every harvest day, is a symbol of two things. 
It is a symbol of our faithfulness to God to be a part of His church. But greater than that is a symbol of God's faithfulness to us to sustain His church and to protect His church and to move His church forward through history. You know, today really will be one for the history books. It'll be one to say that on October the 13th, 2013, that Liberty Baptist could no longer be content with doing ministry as usual here in Appomattox, but saw the need to move forward and to provide more ministry opportunities. And so today, I want to talk some about the future, but I also want to talk a little bit about the past. And really, I want to talk about the past before I talk about the future. I want us to maybe reminisce and to walk down memory lane over what God has done here at Liberty Baptist for 179 years. You know, God has a global vision, and He has a vision that stretches through all of time, but He has done something in our time through the time of this church, and today I want to reflect on it. One of my secondary loves is a love for history, just to see how things move along. So let's do a little bit of history today, and we're going to talk a little bit about the history of this church. Now, obviously, the history of our church is somewhat associated with the history of America. Um, 1607, just to give you some points to, to hang on some reference, because when we say 179 years, most people can't get in their minds what that means. So let's do a little bit of history. 1607 is when Jamestown is settled, all right? So you, there's a good his, historical point. But God began to do something interesting in America in the year 1734. And he began to do it primarily under one man who had rather average results and was not really known to be that great of a speaker, although clearly what we have of his writings, he was a brilliant man, and his name was Jonathan Edwards. And so he preached in Northampton, Massachusetts in 17, well, he'd been preaching before that, but in 1734, to the surprise of Edwards, his preaching that had done pretty much what preaching does, it goes forth, People nod their heads and walk out the door. In 1734, Edwards began to be somewhat overwhelmed because the people began to respond to the same old sermons that Edwards had always preached with emotional outbursts of repentance. And Edwards would begin to try to figure out what God was doing. He would write several books, one of which was called Religious Affections, trying to figure out why people had such an awesome emotional response when the gospel was presented. But nevertheless, Edwards uh, looked out over his congregation and realized that God was doing something. In 1734, we can put that down as a very important point. 1607, Jamestown is settled. Uh, a little over 100 years after that, 1734, God began to really bring revival to America. It would be this, what we call the Great Awakening, that would spark another awakening later on in America, but the missionary fervor in America would be on the move. Now, you may think, many times people think, well, it's the northern states that are less Christianized than the southern states. Not in 1734. It was initially the north that brought the religious fervor of Christianity to the south. That's the, way it, that's the way it traveled. It's interesting, 1734 occurs, and in, then in uh, 17, just a little over 30 years after that, a man shows up to this area as an evangelist. His name is Samuel Harris. Most people have no idea who Samuel Harris is, but Samuel Harris traveled this area um, right around 1771. And he preached around this area and won many converts. And out of Samuel Harris's preaching, 
a little church was born. The church was founded in 1772. The church's name was Rocks Baptist Church. Literally, Rocks Baptist Church got its name Rocks because it was started in, in the woods near a creek um, and near rocks. And at that time, the Sioux Ann Creek, I believe that's the way you say it, although the spelling doesn't, or Swanee, people have different statements. Uh, well, I've talked to different people. Our historian doesn't agree with somebody else. You know how that goes, right? But nevertheless, Swanee Creek, Sioux, whatever it is, there it is. This was the place where the initial converts were baptized at Rocks, and there, uh, there Rocks Baptist Church was born. Rocks Baptist Church was actually one of the first churches in this area. It exists today, 12 miles down the street, uh, if you take 460 towards Farmville. But it was in the heart of Rocks Baptist Church very early on after they were founded in 1772. God began to lay on their heart the need for a church presence here closer uh, to what is now the town of Appomattox. Now to give you a picture of when all of this is happening, Rocks is founded in 1772. The Declaration of Independence is signed in 1776. We have a very different America. You only have uh, 13 original colonies while God is shaping and moving at this point in time. Well, now, after things begin to move, Liberty Baptist has its birthday. Liberty Baptist's birthday, sadly, is not in October, even though we celebrate it in October. Liberty Baptist's birthday is August the 7th, 1834. The reason we moved Harvest Day from August to October is just because everybody is out and about in August and it's a tough time to do a special day. But nevertheless, August the 7th, 1834 is our official birthday. Now really, Liberty had some humble beginnings. You can imagine 1834 is a very different time than even the time that we have. Liberty Baptist was actually started on a porch. Uh, that's a good place to start a church, and there's the best sketch that we have of the porch. Obviously, um, the preacher would stand on the porch, and there's his little podium that he made, and he would preach from the porch, and obviously people would gather uh, in front of the porch. Uh, and Liberty Baptist began on its first day with 11 members. Interestingly enough, one of the members uh, was an African-American lady, and we have her name, Prissa Bird. Uh, and there is where it began. Now, we haven't traveled much, even though we've been around for a long time. Really, the history, we want to talk now a little bit about the history of our buildings. We've really stayed right around this area. We, our first building, we moved from the porch to building what we will call now building number one. All right, it's basically not much. Uh, we don't really even have a good rendering of it. Uh, there it is. Uh, we hope that this is close. It's just a log cabin near the railroad tracks uh, near Liberty Cemetery. Obviously, we began to develop right around the railroad. And we, there was this crudely built, constructed building, which probably wasn't much at all. I mean, you've got to think here. Uh, we're, we're and now about 1840. So, you know, we're not, they're not having, they're not building high rises yet, so we started out pretty humbly. Uh, then we moved to our second building, 1855, um, and we stayed here for a while. Now, 1855, the start of the Civil War began in 1861. You need to know this for crying out loud, you live in Appomattox. Um, we're going to celebrate our 150th year of the Civil War. The Civil War ends in 1865. It's a four-year. If you notice in this picture, you can see gurneys. You can see soldiers. And so we were, if you know how the Battle of Appomattox took place, you can see here that uh, we're carrying 
Union soldiers more than likely because they're the ones that got shot up and, the hosp and, our, and our church was used as a hospital uh, very temporarily during the, the Civil War. Interestingly enough, during this time period, Liberty Baptist had a large influence on the African-American community. Um, we had 66 African-American members, four of whom would become pastors uh, during this tumultuous time. Now, uh, you, you know what's happening in the Civil War, uh, and here's Liberty. Four African-American ministers will go out uh, from this place. We actually then planted a church. We planted Galilee Baptist Church, which is down near towards the historical park, uh, and and some of the members, you know, African American preachers a lot better than white guys, right? Come on, I mean, you know, so you know, all they they went to they left to go hear decent preaching, uh, but four of them stayed back, you know, uh, you know, you imagine you, back in that time, you know, I'm sure those get the, the African American guys get going, and those other guys were. Dearly beloved, you know, they're just horrible, you know, so you can imagine, they left. They said, we're going to Galilee. Y'all can sit in here if y'all want to. We're going to go hear real preaching. But nevertheless, uh, forced aid, uh, 62 left and went and started Galilee. Now building number three happens, 1888. This building, we're starting to progress a bit. Uh, th this building, the, the front doors of building three are said to be at the front doors of the large iron gates at Liberty Cemetery. So that's our best guess um, at what we had. Um, we were at this point in time uh, no longer able to baptize in a creek and we got a baptistry in 1888. I'm sure all the new converts appreciated an indoor baptistry rather than having to be dunked uh, in the creek. And then we move to building number four. Uh, and building number four, 1898, interestingly enough, was building number three dismantled and moved there right on top of the property that we will build on today. So we have already built a sanctuary on the property that we are going to build an activity building. When we meet in our gymnasium, when we meet in our classrooms, we can say that uh, from 1898 to 1916, the church met on this property already. We have, can you imagine that we have already occupied this place, that space for 30 years as Liberty Baptist, and then we let it go, let somebody build a house on it, but now we're going back to get the land that we should have never given away in the past. May I say to our church, if you have it, keep it, all right? You know, because we've been around too long. If you get in tight times, somebody come up with the money to keep it. Don't sell our land. It really puts future generations in a bind. I'm going to say it right in the microphone. If you got it, keep it. We've been around for 179 years. We might need it. So keep it. All right. Well, somebody won't listen to that, even though I said it here on, uh, on Harvest Day. And so there we are, building number four. And then uh, building number five. It was really from 18... It was in that building, 1898 to 1915 that God really began to do a real work here. It was also around that time that Appomattox began to really change. And God began to do something. We actually have the minutes. I found them one time and I've lost them, but nevertheless, the minister stands up and makes the appeal to build this sanctuary. And it said, the minister stood up and said, the issue of the building has come before us and we have to do something. And said the congregation sat in, he did it right at 11 o'clock service unannounced. And the congregation sat in silence for 10 minutes after he said it, just like we don't know what to do. And finally they made the move, let's just go ahead and do it. They made the decision in 1915 to do it. And on July the 7th, 2nd rather, 1916, they, they finished the facility. Now when this happened, 
Appomattox was a very different place. I've got a picture of the town of Appomattox in 1916. There it is. Pretty rugged, pretty barren. It is said that there would be often more times people in attendance at Liberty Baptist on a given Sunday than the population of the whole place. There'd be more in the worship service than there were in the whole place. People would come in and here they would be. During that time, 1875, they, would give, they gave money to mission work in China. They supported missionaries who supported the soldiers in the Civil War. And so today, after that, we have built some other uh, education buildings, no doubt, after that. But today we say, by God's grace, we are moving forward and we are going to build a building in two phases. Um, and here's the future building at Liberty. You see the plans, they're all over, they're all over the, the sanctuary today. But let me give us some goals for vision, and then I'll just look briefly in our text today. What could be our vision for next Harvest Day? Twelve months from today, where should we be? What should be happening? God has certainly been faithful to us in the past. What can we anticipate 12 months from now into the future? Well, by God's grace, we can anticipate a completed facility. In 12 months from, from now, I would like this. I'd like to see next Harvest Day, we'd be able to cut the ribbon on the building. We'd have our service there all together, and there would be people running out of the doors. Is that possible? Not because we just want people for people's sake, but because we want to reach Appomattox. And the last time I checked, on this Sunday morning, 2,500 or 3,500 people out of 16,000 made their way to church, which means every church in this community needs to do more to reach their neighbor, and we want to do our part. It's possible for God to give us, uh, to, for God to give us quite a few more of our unchurched people in this community to be a part of, of what God is doing here. Uh, by next year, Harvest Day. I'd like to see a few other things. Twelve months from now, I'd like to see a, a more expanded children's ministry. I'd like to see that we are the place where the children of this community are taken care of. I'd like to see an ex expanded ministry of compassion, especially to the children, which we already see through our back-to-school and backpack ministries, but why not after-school stuff? Why not helping the children every way that we can? By the way, many children don't have mom and dads to come home to. We can become that place to the children in our community through the use of this facility. And we will take the lead and already are on advancing our security measures so the children are safe, but we will forge ahead to do better in this area. I would like to see us be a place for expanded children's ministry. I would further like us to, to be a place for expanded youth ministry. God has already given us more than we could ask for in our youth ministry, in some ways more than our facility can handle. And so I, I would like to take off the, 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 the restraints here in the youth ministry and to really become the place where we, where we raise up a new generation of Christian leaders in this community through the use of our facility. Listen, Rusty will not be content for us to build a building and it not be used. We will build a building so that can be used and overused for the need for us to build again. That's the plan. Not because, listen, Russell doesn't want to get, be involved in building campaigns, but if he must, he will for the purpose of ministry. And finally, I would not like us to see this building as a place for merely religious functions as sometimes they are conceived. But I want to see this as a hub for the community a gift to the community where there can be, as there even is in this place, daily fellowship, constant recreation, where a, an awesome reversal could happen rather than us have to continually go out to the community, which we will, that also the community will come to us. 
And they will come and be a part of what we're doing. And we can talk with them and minister to them through the programs we have. Wouldn't it be awesome to be such a blessing to this community that the unchurched come to our place to do our things and we talk to them here? That would be a wonderful new reversal. And I believe that it is already in place. Now I want us to look just a few moments as we round out our generosity series. So if you have your Bible, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 12 through 15, where we will really see a clarion call here, how we can bless others through our generosity. The reason why we move ahead is for the purpose of blessing others. We're not looking for a blessing, we're looking to give a blessing. The first point, as Paul wraps up his words on generosity, and really they are words to us as well. The first point today is our generosity allows us to meet real needs. Now I want us to only look at the first part of verse 12. It says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, comma. Now Paul's going to talk about some other things today but he's definitely going to talk about that generosity of the church meets needs. Now, the, this generosity, the generosity of the Corinthian church, enabled the need at the Jerusalem church to be met. And so it's important for us to know that our generosity, if it is well thought out and well planned, really does meet needs. And the Corinthians could, could, could be well aware that what they gave helped the church at Jerusalem. You know, I think it's a very important question for us to ponder. Why does the church meet needs? You know, it's one of our responsibilities to meet the needs of our community and beyond. I will tell you the reason the church meet, meets needs is because... As Christians, we should have embraced the compassion of Jesus. If we, if we glance at the life of Jesus for only a moment, we notice that Jesus wanted to minister to the whole person and He would attempt to meet their needs. And so we see that through the ministry of Jesus, brokenness is overturned and healing takes its place. You know, I think one of the main reasons for the ineffectiveness of churches is that they have failed to meet needs in their own community. You know, I want to, if I ever write a book, which I probably will, here's going to be the title of it. You want to know it? The Community Focused Church. There's the title of it. And here's the premise. Good works are the, is a great context for the good news. If you can produce something in your community that the community can understand, churched and unchurched alike, that they say, this is good, it provides you a platform to share the gospel. May I say, there have been generations, potentially, I don't know people's hearts, but it seems to be lazy Christians. We want to present the gospel to you, but do nothing for you. And may I say, that will not work. It is not the way Jesus did it, and it is lazy. We have to do something. We have to get out. We have to put a shovel in the ground. We've got to twist the light bulbs in a widow's home. We've got to do something for the children. We've got to, we've got to help the students. We have to do something so that we earn the right to talk to people. And, the, and good works are a great context for the good news. And as we do that... We won't find closed doors. We will find open doors as we have already seen it happening. Well, there's a closed door. Uh, but, uh, but we have open doors as well. Uh, 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 nevertheless, uh, well, that was, boy, you know, you talk about timing. No, the door is open. Open the door again. <laughs> uh, we, will, we will have open doors even though that door shut. <laughs> But don't miss the point here is that when we meet needs, people come to us and say, why are you meeting my need? 
They may not understand the gospel, but they can understand what you just did and when they ask you why, or you can offer the why while you do it. Of anybody who ought to be meeting the needs in the community, it ought to be us who are filled with the compassion of Jesus. No other organization should be able to compete with that. No other organization is internally motivated and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to have compassion on a broken world with the hope of final restoration at the end of the story. Nobody has that but the church. And it ought to be the church of all people that is leading the charge in the meeting of needs in the community. What happens? Do we just meet needs for needs sake and then that's always happened? No. When we meet needs and we do this in the context of gospel witness people have not only received a service from us but they began to have deep affection for us that is where God can do something great Paul mentions this the second point today is our generosity allows others to thank God because of our obedience to give he says it's not only for just the meeting of needs. The latter part of verse 12 says, but it is also overflowing in many acts of thanksgiving to God through the proof of this service. They will glorify God for your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with others and in their prayers for you they will have deep affection for you because of the surpassing grace of God on you want to be awesome where the church stands as a symbol of God's blessing when the church operates correctly that's what it stands for it stands as a place of blessing. See, when we meet needs, not just because it's a good thing to do, but when we meet needs in Jesus' name and in the context of doing that, present the gospel to them, people don't just say, well, isn't Rusty nice for the service that he has done because I point away from myself and you point away from yourself and say I do this not because this is something I want to do but I do it because I am following Jesus you know what people do in that context they don't just bless you and this church they bless God and that is a good thing you know what if I could announce today that there was a business coming in town that would eradicate any job problem that there's going to be in this community how much enthusiasm would be in this community if that was announced why is there not enthusiasm when a new steeple is raised why every time a new steeple is raised do people not get super excited well another church has started well I wonder what they're gonna do that's what we get this, this steeple ought to be a symbol of blessing. We ought to be more excited when God's people move in and His work is started than in any other institution in the community. Now, all institutions are important. I'm not demeaning one to exalt another. But the church should be seen as a place of blessing. You know, and just, I just think about the children and youth and the young adults and anybody who has who's been a, who who has received the ministry of this church? It's interesting. Even when I run into very older people, they can reminisce almost on the spot about times at which the church family ministered to them 30 years ago. And it's not just Thanksgiving that the church did it. There is deep affection for that body of believers that did it. And so you get to be that type of people if you want to be. You get to be stamped through time as a group of people that were a blessing. In the earliest of the Christian story, God told Abraham, I'm going to make you a blessing so that you can be a blessing. And wouldn't it be awesome that as we continue to reach out 
that God allows us to bless this community and the community because of our movement to follow Jesus to bless them, they bless God. That's what we want to happen. And the third and final point today in conclusion, our generosity allows us to give practical expression to God for his gift to us. May I say, if we don't express this type of blessing to the community, we have failed to see the blessing that was given to us. This two-chapter discussion on giving concludes with verse 15, and this is what it says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Why do we give? Because God has given to us a gift that we cannot even fully describe. Every gift I've given, I, I can, every gift I have gotten, I can describe it. No matter how good it's been, I could describe it. But the gift of the grace of God poured out on unworthy men and women is indescribable, isn't it? In its fullness. We can understand it in a shadow, but we cannot grasp it in its essence. And the reason that we move out is for this. You say, so Rusty, why are we going to meet needs in the context of meet needs, present the gospel, and pray that we can be a blessing to this community? Well, so our actions can give practical expression to God that we truly do glorify Him and believe He is who he said he is. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, God has offered a free gift. It's the free gift of salvation. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I'll be right down here at the front. If you're here today and you are a Christian and you want to join with this fellowship, I'll be right down here at the front. But my final appeal to you today is this. Let's be generous to see God's work in Appomattox continue. Let's not break ground and then stop. Let's break ground and this be the spark plug for new enthusiasm, a new spark for enthusiasm for future ministry. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, please, the altar's available. And maybe you are a Christian today and you need to say, God, I, I just want to come down here to this altar, bow my knee, and say, God, help me to be this type of person to move this church and your work forward. If you need to do that, the altar's open. You can bow a knee. It's not going to hurt you. Today is a day where God has certainly been faithful to us. May we continue to be faithful to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. That through 179 years of this church's existence, God, there were probably many times where we could have went out of existence. And God, we thank you that not only we are alive, but we are growing. God, we just ask you to help us. God, may there be a person here today who's never trusted in Jesus. May today be the day. God, may this body of believers continue to be generous so that your work moves forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let it be said of us that the Lord was our passion that with gladness we bore every cross we were given that we fought the good fight that we finished the course knowing within us the power of the risen Lord let the cross be our glory and the Lord be our song. By mercy made holy, by the Spirit made strong. Let the cross be our glory and the Lord be our song till the 
likeness of Jesus be through us made known. Let the cross be our glory and the Lord be our song. <clears throat> Let it be said of us, we were marked by forgiveness, we were known by our love and delighted in meekness. We were ruled by His peace, needing unity's goal, joined in one body that Christ would be seen by all. Let the cross be our glory Thy mercy made holy, by the Spirit made strong. Let the cross be our glory, and the Lord be our song. to meet every opportunity and manage every obstacle with grace. God, we pray that your life would be seen through us and that others would bless you because of our generosity to them. God, we thank you ultimately for your gift to us. How awesome and indescribable it is in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>